Hi, I'm Angelica Bell and welcome to the NatWest Business Show. Joining me today is a very exciting guest. She is a former dragon, a serial investor and the founder and CEO of Nightcap PLC. It's the incredible Sarah Willingham. Sarah has shown us a glimpse of what she looks for when investing in Dragon's Den, but today she's here to break down how business owners could make the most of their investor relationships. So let's get back in. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Not at all. Very interested in your little journey. In fact, we like to kick off the show by giving our guests a challenge, 60 seconds, to run through their journey. Ooh, short and 60 seconds. Yeah. I like that. So, uh, born up north, Stoke. All my family and friends are all still up there. Proper Stokey at heart. Uh, fast forward, worked really hard in my 20s. Probably didn't play enough. Probably worked a bit, bit too hard. Very driven. Um, did everything early. Then decided, because I wanted to have a family, decided to become an entrepreneur, not because I had this beautiful dream of being an entrepreneur, but actually because I wanted to control my own diary, make a bit of cash to be free to be a mama. Then spectacularly met my wonderful husband, spectacularly had four children, which is what I'd always dreamt of, had them very, very quickly. Gave up being an entrepreneur at that point because I realized I couldn't actually have 1,500 staff and four kids. Um, started to invest, did a bit of TV, did a show called The Restaurant with Raymond Blanc, uh, had some regulars on daytime TV, realized that didn't fit in with being a family either. So retracted from all of that. I know I've only got 60 seconds, probably got <laughs> over that now, but I'm nearly there. Um, and then really quickly, uh, then got a call. Would I, would I screen test for Dragon's Den? I was like, why not? Deborah Meenan might become my friend. How exciting. Ended up doing it, loved it, had a brilliant time, took my kids out of school, went traveling around the world, didn't come back for three years, moved to Brighton, and now I'm sat here with you. One thing that stands out from your little synopsis is that you engage in something, then retreat, engage, retreat. Do you know what? That's a really interesting observation, actually. I, it's exactly what I do. So I define success as when I've made myself redundant from something. And I wonder if that's what it is. So that's what I do. I kind of go all in and then I try and make myself redundant and then I move back. And then I go back in again and do something. And also, I think as well, I'm all the decisions in my life um, have been very, very much driven by my life and what I want. So I don't believe in a career path. I only believe in a life path. So work has absolutely got to fit in with what it is that I'm doing in my life. And of course, life changes, right? 100%. You know, you're in your 20s and it's easy and you're swanning around. I can do the 100 hour weeks. I then decide I want to have kids. I can't. So I have to retreat and think again. And okay, what how what does work need to look like if I if I really want to go all in and be a mom and I want lots of children? I don't know if I can have lots of children. I don't even know if I'm going to meet the person that I want all the children with. I don't know if that's going to happen, but at least let's set myself up for success in that. So again, I come back in and make that decision. And then I start to have children and I'm like, whoa, this doesn't work. I thought I'd gone down the right path. And whilst I had, I needed to retreat from it because actually it was much more full on being a mom than I thought it was going yeah. to be. So again, I retreat and go, right, what does work need to look like to fit in with life? So I go again. And each time it's been retreating. And even the bit where I talked about going traveling around the world, you know, that took me two years to make myself redundant from my life to be able to do that. So it's always about that kind of pulling back where people, things, businesses, everything is not reliant on me. You know, that's that to me is the ultimate freedom, right? Let's talk about Dragon's Den. Yeah. Because how did that change for your course of life? Yeah, so that was not, I mean, I really hadn't expected that. So um, was it called Out of the Blue? Completely out of the blue. And actually, it's, it's a reasonably funny story. Well, I think it's funny. Ironic anyway. So... At that time, Michael and I used to sit down at the beginning of, Michael's my husband, he sit down at the beginning of um, each year, and this is going to make it sound really boring, but work with me, I promise. I'm, I'm here, boring, I'm promise, here. Promise. Um, and we used to sit down and kind of map out time. So time is the most important thing to me. It's the commodity that I trade in. Nothing else. It's all about my time. So we used to sit and literally draw a pie chart of time. So pie chart's like 360 degrees. Makes it sound boring, but honestly, it gets, no, good. I'm, I'm, it gets good. So we used to do this little pie chart. So we'd start with like, what did last year look like? You know, how, do, how many holidays did we take? How much did we work? How much time did we spend as a family, as a couple? Exercise, new skills, whatever it might be, anything. It could be anything in that pie chart. 
And then we go, right, what do we want this year to look like? And I got, I started to draw out how I wanted to spend my time, more time as a mom, blah, 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 blah. And you come around and you think, oh, I've got, I've got to pay for it. So you've got to work and that gets a bit bigger. And you keep going around this pie chart and things expand. And you think, oh, I've got to. And I realized I had this whole section in my pie chart, which was media and TV. And it made me look at it in absolute purest form as a proportion of my life, my time. And I went, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? What do I get from it? I don't know. So I made the decision there and then to give up all TV and media. I kid you not, email in my inbox, 11 o'clock in the morning, ping, dear Sarah, <laughs> would you like, would you consider coming in to do a screen test for Dragon's Den? Oh. So you know when you can't unsee something and I'm like, oh no, close it down again. It's still there. Read it again. So I'm like, oh. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> was being on Dragon Den a driver for setting up Nightcap PLC? No, Dragon's Den it w is about investing. So it, it's about, you know, you can choose to take active investments or not. So I've just spent three days with the Craft Gin Club, for example, which was a Dragon's Den investment. Yeah. Three days off site. We've been we were in Southampton and we do that once a year where we where we do the strategy for for the year. So I'm a very active investment in that one, for example. Nightcap was different. So whilst Nightcap was the answer to a not a problem, but a I guess a problem actually that I had with an investment. So when COVID struck, it was obviously hospitality. We didn't know what was going to happen. It was an it was an absolute carnage. And this was really early on. So we'd gone from sort of end of March, the lockdown, fast forward lockdown, July, saw the world open up, although we were still very restricted, but saw the world open up and go, hang on, people, you know, we're pack animals, right? We need to socialize. We need to be together. My husband's really smart. Like he's way smarter than me in so many ways. Brilliant, 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 brilliant guy. We talked about what the economy was going to look like, what the macro was going to look like coming out of um, COVID. And there were three things. One was I had noticed through the London Cocktail Club that the real balance of power in property had switched from landlord to tenant. So the negotiating was completely different. We were now talking about covenants rather than who'd got the biggest wadge of cash to pay to get into a site, big premiums and stuff. So that was a big one. The second one was that everyone taking on the C-bills, which were great and we needed them in the industry. Really, really important, actually. They, it, they were critical to the survival of hospitality. But what it meant was that people's balance sheets were shot to bits, basically. B businesses were shot, those, the balance sheets were, they were heavily indebted um, because there was no equity cash investment. It was all coming in as debt. But their P&Ls were re really sound. So, i.e., we were going out and drinking and drinking a lot. Like, we were all still going out and the demand was there. So, you've got a skewed balance sheet towards debt and a strong P&L. So, that balance sheet means that if people had taken out these C bills and have got loads of debt, then the banks quasi controlled these businesses, a lot of them actually, or they might have been backed by private equity who also could have done, who also could have had significant debt, but would have been part of a portfolio of private equity. And therefore, there would have been no growth capital left to take advantage of the property situation. And the third thing is you'd have loads of just really fed up entrepreneurs that would have been just about ready for an exit, just about ready to actually have some kind of event in their business, get some capital in, either grow fast. So the entrepreneurs will have sat there going, but this is an amazing time to grow, but they wouldn't have been able to constraints from private equity or the bank. So you put those three things together and I was like, why don't we do what we did in our early thirties and basically float a cash shell on AIM and buy up groups of cocktail bars um, that were exactly as I've just described. So, you know, taken on loads of debt, run by the banks, fed up entrepreneurs, their equity is underwater and they wanted to grow but didn't have the capital to grow and raise equity, not debt, equity. And by raising that equity would put us in a really strong position to be able to capitalise that, that industry. Basically, that was the thinking behind Nightcap. So that's what we did. 
Where did you get this entrepreneurial spirit from? I just have always questioned the way that things were done. And I was always fascinated by business. Couldn't understand how we were all wearing the same branded trainers, drinking the same branded drink, eating the same branded cheese. Couldn't get my head around it. I was like, how does this work? And we used to go to school singing Finger of Fudge is Just Enough. You know, like it was all of these things. I was like, what is that? And then I realized it was business and ended up going to study business. And actually just, I loved it. And I am very lucky from an early age I'd worked from the age of 11, paper round, and then washing old ladies' hair. That's a whole podcast. <laughs> um, and then you're working in restaurants and hospitality. So I was lucky I found my thing really early on. But the entrepreneurial spirit is, I don't even know if it is an entrepreneurial spirit. It's more like this, I just want to live a really good life. I wanted the life. And as I said at the beginning, work has had to fit in. So you've got no choice but to be an entrepreneur, really. What else could I have done? But still today, I mean, I mean, you're still the you're sort of like the figurehead, isn't it? You're the one out there, let's you know, and you're you're leading. You're a woman, yes, yeah, yeah, leading an investment company, and that's rare. I did this as speech recently um, up north. Actually, I was in Blackpool, and I started off by saying, "Right, can everybody in the room put the hand up if you ever worked in hospitality?" And I swear it must be like ninety five percent of the room. Everyone's got their hand up. Oh, yeah, I remember the time. It's great. Right, keep your hand up if you're still in hospitality. Must be about three people in the whole room left their hand up. And that's the thing with hospitality is we touch everybody, but we don't keep them. And I'd like to keep more. I'd like people to see it as more of a career. Well, you're a trailblazer. You know, you're, you're doing things, you're being active in sort of trying to change that and stuff. But you must have faced challenges along the way. Oh, I mean... I mean, the hardest challenge is having four kids in four years and still trying to do all of this. I mean, Superwoman. I, mean, I don't know about superwoman. I mean, I implode like everybody else implodes, right? Like, you know, the definition of moronic is to keep doing the same thing and expect something to change, right? Mm. I think. Yeah. Like, you've got to change something if it's not working. And also, if you know, I say to some of my friends, well, if they're thinking, I can't do this, I can't do that, I'm like... As soon as you take one step, it becomes easier to to see that yeah. and see your best self. Totally. And to make that change. Yeah. Because it's not I like we, you know, not everyone has that self-belief, self-awareness no. straight away. Sometimes you have to learn it. Yeah, and you you learn it exactly as you just said. You learn it by doing it and feeling it. Like you start to feel that empowerment. You're like, you know what, I've got this. I've actually got this. And you know, and I've suffered with imposter syndrome, you know, for years and years. And, you know, one of the biggest moments of enlightenment for me in my 20s was realising that's actually a real superpower because they're all misjudging me. And that's absolutely brilliant. So let them all misjudge me. That is a superpower. Yeah. And let it be a superpower. And I remember the moment when I realised how misjudged I'd been in a room and how powerful it made me feel to think you lot have got absolutely no idea. <laughs> what I will say is that like having that self-reflection, that self-awareness to go, I'm not good at this. This isn't for me. Or, you know, just to realise this is, so you should, somebody else should do this. Mm, which can help you in business as well. Exactly. And then I can do this better. Yeah. So as a serial investor, what three steps can business owners make to be more attractive to people like you, investors? Yes, good question. So I always look for three things. So first of all, what is your product or service? And like, who are you trying to sell to? So I've got to see that the clear path to why people might need what it is that you're trying to sell and to understand who those people are. Because people come in and go, oh, yeah, I've got this great product. It's like target market, 7.2 billion people. You're like, what? That's crazy. You know, you can't have a target market, 7.2 billion people. They come in these crazy numbers. Yeah, like the global market for whatever clothes is, you know, gazillions. Therefore, I'm going to start a clothing business. What? You know, so it's it's honing in. What is your product? What differentiates you from what's already out there? Um, and and who is it that's going to buy it? So that's the first thing. The second thing, really important, is how do I talk to that person who's going to buy it? So you've told me who they are, but how do I reach them? So again, 7.2 billion people, good luck with that with a budget of 50 grand. That's not going to happen. So 
who are these people and how can I get into them? That's basically what's your marketing plan. So, you know, what's your ROI on every pound that you spend on marketing? That's that's basically that middle bit. And then the third bit is you as a person, as a human, what makes you better placed than the person to your left or the person to your right or the person behind you to make this particular business or any business a success? And sometimes you might find the third one. Sometimes I can sit and think, you're just great. I don't actually think your business model is great yet, but you are great. And do I think that they have the agility in their mind to be able to go down a path and do exactly what we've just been talking about and go, it's not quite working the way I thought it was going to. However, this is my path. So a lot of times in the early days of a startup, you you'll find the business model within. It's not going to be the one that you wrote in the first day. It rarely is. You know, so allow yourself to have that fluidity and agility, actually, to be able to move when you realize, oh my God, I've found my business model. This is where I get my 70% ROI or um, this is where I found a really efficient way of talking to a particular market that wants to be able to buy this product, which is slightly different than the one I set out with, but they really want this. And do you have that agility in your mind, the ability to step back? Because some people will just continue to go, even when it's not working. Yeah. You've got to learn to say no. So those three things, I would say, are really important. And when you get all of those three together, you're like, yeah, I'm in. So that's what you're looking for? Yeah. How does a business know they've got the best partner? In, in, their, in their investor, this is actually so important so Im I tell more people to not get investment. Really? Yes, than I do people to go and get investment. And it's for this exact reason. Because, well, it's kind of for this that is that reason. It's also part of the dilution. It's all about that capital structure that I was telling you about, that I was talking about at the beginning. Mm. I would interview an investor. If, if they're going to, if you just want money, then just make sure your shareholders agreements as tight as... And you've got your, so you've dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's in terms of that original structure. Make sure you do it right and get really good advice on that. And if you just want money, just get the investment in and don't speak to your investor, done. But if you're talking about a partner, that's really different. Or if you're talking about an active investor, that's also really different. And you should interview that investor just as much as they would interview you, just as much. What are they going to bring to the table can you work with them? Do they understand your business? Do they understand you actually as an entrepreneur? It's really important because that clash can be really detrimental. So that's the sort of emotional side of it. But for goodness sake, make sure you get your legals right. Like you've got to be able to either get out of this. You've got to be able to switch it over if you have got it wrong. It's your business. So keep control of it. Hold the steering wheel of your business. Don't let somebody else come in and, and, and try and take control. And that makes complete sense because in order to have a constructive partnership, everyone needs to know what they want to achieve from that partnership from, from the outset. Completely. And if you're not on the right page, it can become really toxic very, very quickly. And I think, um, you know, if you need a particular skill set, get that particular skill set in. But remember... The skill set you need today is not going to be the skill set you need tomorrow, right? So is this an investor that can grow with you? You know, don't sell everything up front because if your business is, if you've got to get investment in, and again, this is back to the capital structure. If you've got to get investment in really early on and you're diluting yourself, you might only, you might think, well, I'm only selling 25%. But if you're successful, the chances are you're going to need another round of funding and another round of funding. And I see so often, and it's painful to see, but I see so often when just as the business starts to become successful, the entrepreneur's diluted down to like 7%. What advice would you give to business owners who want to scale their business in the current economic climate? <sighs> you see that big sigh? Yeah, you... It's not a great time to be scaling, a, like really scaling a business. So I would say sustainable growth, sustainable growth with 
all your time focused on cash right now? It's almost maintaining what you've got. Maintain what you've got, grow very sustainably. So you take advantage of the, there will be certain things that will come out of this and will be part of this recession that will mean you will be able to grow. So for example, with nightcap, property is really cheap, right? Yeah. So absolutely take advantage on that. And are we still getting a return on investment on our pound? Yes, we are. So great. Still getting 75% return on investment. Really important. But you can't borrow in this environment. Interest rates are skyrocketing, as we've seen. So the worst thing that can happen to a business right now is running out of cash because you will not be able to get equity investment. Actually, that's probably a gross. It, it will be very, very, very hard to get equity investment and it will be very, very, very hard to get debt. So to get additional capital into the business, unless it's from angels, for example, is going is not going to be easy. There'll be obviously there are anomalies. So if you've got a normal distribution curve, you've got businesses sat on the outside of the normal distribution curve, of course, will still, you know, go 300% growth, 400% growth, 500%. We'll still see that. We'll still see those businesses, just like we did in COVID. But in general, cash, cash, cash. You've got to keep your eye on cash because you've got to assume that things will get worse. And you probably can't borrow and you probably can't get more investment into your business. Assume that everything then is a bonus. That 100%. So okay. mitigate risk yeah. now. As you grow, mitigate risk. Well, I called you your super mum before and you, <laughs> you battered that away. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maintain that. <laughs> because I did want to dive into another area um, that you touched upon about being a mum and yeah. an entrepreneur and being so successful. And for any other mums listening who are thinking, this is a world I want to get into. Yeah. I, you know, I want to... Take that risk. Yeah. What advice would you give them? So without a shadow of a doubt, it's the hardest thing, I think, is to get that right. And I don't know if we ever really get it right. And also the definition of right for me is different than for you and is different from somebody else. It's a very personal thing. And again, that self-awareness is really, really important, I think, in this. I think the thing that works for me, and it doesn't mean it works for everybody, that the thing that works for me is I don't mix them. And I, I learned that it doesn't work for me when I try and mix them. So when I try to mix them, I'm neither a good mom, nor am I really focused on whatever I'm doing with work. So if I'm trying to take phone calls while I was pushing a pram, for example, or if I was trying to do my emails while I was trying to play with one of my children, that didn't work because I was, I was not in either. So I learned pretty quickly that I need to either work and it's really important to me to work. Like I'm Sarah Winningham when I work. I like working. I like being me. You know, it's important to me to have that identity. I yeah, like it. Yeah. I like it. Um, but there's nothing that I love more than being a mom. And then it goes back to the beginning of our conversation about success. I mean, you went into business and became an entrepreneur so that you could have those moments. Exactly. And that's exactly why I became an entrepreneur. I loved my life in my 20s working for other people. I was learning, traveling around the world. It was great. I, I had no desire to have my own business. I wasn't thinking, oh, I must go and be this entrepreneur. That sounds, that's a cool word. I didn't, and you know, that wasn't the plan. It was quite simply because I suddenly realized I was about 28 and went, well, I can't be doing this. Yeah, you know, I've just been to Moscow, Geneva and Malta all in the same week. I'm like, I can't be doing that if I want a family. So I realised I had to make a change. I would have to do something different. And I knew it wasn't going to happen overnight. And, you know, it took me a few years. I did an MBA and found a business and bought a business. And, you know, all that stuff. I, well, I ended up throw doing in, all this stuff. You'd just throw in the MBA there. But actually, well, it was <laughs> it was kind of my transition year where in, from like working proper work where you've got a job for somebody else to going it alone. So what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Um, I think it's got to be from a guy that's actually still in my phone as Yoda. You're joking. He's still in my phone as Yoda. And but he's not he Yoda. Said, he's not actually oh, Yoda, right, right, right. but almost, <laughs> like almost. He doesn't levitate, but... Um, and he said to me in my 20s, actually, he said, surround yourself with brilliant people, Sarah. And I just thought, oh, great. Like, that was worth it that was worth listening to like how clever are you you know great piece of advice I now realize just how right that was and this is in every aspect of your life like whether it's your personal life 
have the friends that rejoice in your successes, that you don't make them feel small because you've done something great and you phone them because, and they think, oh, well, oh, why hasn't that happened to me? Be surround yourself with people who, who, who let you shine. I've got the most amazing, I mean, my Stokies are awesome that I've known since I was like six years old. My new group of friends in Brighton are the most positive beautiful humans you can imagine that just rejoice in everybody else's success really positive so I think that's really important and then in business terms in in work it's about people that fill your gaps people that know the things that you're not good at and the people who are brilliant exceptional at the things that you're not good at so surrounding yourself with brilliant people is absolutely the key to success whether it's in your personal life or whether or not it's in your work life. It's the key to success. Sarah, you've been brilliant. I am going to go off now <laughs> and draw my pie chart. Yay. You knew I was going to say that, didn't you? <laughs> I did. <laughs> Sarah, thank you so much for joining me for this episode. And thank you for listening. Remember to hit follow and subscribe so you don't miss out on hearing our incredible guests still to come. And if today's episode has inspired you, head to our website to find out more insights and potential solutions that could help you take action today. Until next time.